Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. What a joy it is to be here, and uh, I want to thank Will for reminding me this morning that it was after the third song that I needed to get up. That's, that's helpful. Not quite as bad as Ken's text letting me know to, uh, I needed to head south when I got to the airport, uh, so I appreciate these brothers and their help. Um, it is such a joy to be with all of you again, to be back with Four Corners Church and worship. You know, the church is the people. Uh, I've, I'm conscientious about calling this the church building uh, because the church really is the people. And to be back with our church, uh, to be back with our church family. We've had the opportunity to talk with many of you over the last couple of weeks. And uh, so we've seen a lot of faces. We've been able to have conversations and just to see how all of you are doing. But our family has missed all of you. And so we're so thankful to be back. We are also grateful to all of you for what you have given our family over these last three months. Uh, So much support, so much warmth and kindness. Uh, We came back through uh, some in our gospel community group. Uh, We came back to our house being cleaned and uh, signs up for us and a refrigerator full of food. Just so sweet, overwhelming kindness. Uh, And then just for all of your prayers, thank you for the support that you have shown our family through your prayers. And and all of the kids who've written these little cards for our kids that uh, came over uh, in waves, first with uh, the strains. The strains came, they had a trip, and they came by and and visited with us. And then the Baileys, uh, they came. We had some great time with them, and they they gave us some of those cards. And then the Forbuses later came uh, for a short time. So it was just wonderful also to see faces incrementally from Four Corners, and just to be reminded of the family that we are a part of here at this church. It was a refreshing time for our family. Uh, We lived just a few doors down from the place we lived before we moved. We we lived in Scotland for four years, and uh, before we moved, that was the place we brought Jake home from the hospital to, uh, and that was where we lived the last two years we were there. So uh, we were just down the way from that, so in the same neighborhood, same grocery stores and all of that. So you can imagine that was just full of nostalgia. Uh, We were able to connect with many of the people from our church, Uh, so that was such a blessing to be able uh, to have meals with people we haven't seen in a decade. Some of them we've kept in touch with, some of them we haven't, so to be able to to see them uh, grayer, as I am much grayer, uh, but to be able to see them and spend time with them, have meals with them, and just to see what God is doing there. Uh, and the churches that have been planted through that church to go to the services of those various churches as well and to see the Lord's work. Just a reminder, and I, and I think this was clear to our kids, just a reminder that God is at work all over the world, that we can get just focused on what's happening here right in front of us, but that God is mightily at work all over the globe. And so we just praise God for, uh, for his church, universal, uh, as it is Uh, embodied all over in local churches. One funny connection that I'll mention is the church we were were at there, Charlotte Chapel. Uh, One of the weeks, uh, a guest preacher came, and he's from Ohio, but has lived in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa for a a long time, and uh, is a pastor there. And he preached, and as he was preaching, Jennifer and I were looking at each other saying, "Um, I wonder if he knows Tommy Vanderwalt, uh, you know, Tommy, uh, one of the missionaries we support, uh, w- one of the, the workers there in South Africa trying to get, and throughout Africa, trying to get gospel resources into the hands of pastors. Uh, and <laughs> so we're sitting there asking, I wonder if he knows him. Of course, after the service, it's busy. We couldn't go up and ask him. But it turns out that the, the, the guest preacher there for the Pillar Network Conference that week, uh, the guest preacher there is Tommy's father-in-law. So not only does he know him, uh, he knows him well. So it's just a small world kind of story that, uh, that, that connection there as I got to hear Pastor Doug, Doug Van Meter, uh, preach there uh, from Brackenhurst Baptist Church in Johannesburg all the way to Charlotte Chapel in Scotland. So that was, that was neat to see. Some of you have heard me share my John Piper story from my first time in Edinburgh, I know Will's ears are, are perking up back there. He, 
Will used to preach some early on when I came. He used to preach from time to time, and he would always include a John Piper reference in every sermon. So you might remember those days uh, a while ago. But uh, I have a big John Piper story from my first time in Edinburgh. Uh, I was in the last half of my academic program, and our oldest child, Jake, was born. And, And I was just so overcome, so impacted by the weight of being a godly father Uh, and by just the weight of what stood in front of me. And of course, as all of us as dads want to do, wanting to start that well, uh, wanting to start out well. um, As a dad. And I just have such sweet memories. Uh, Walking around Edinburgh, walking around the streets, Uh, listening to John Piper sermons on the family. Now, what I did was I went and downloaded all the John Piper sermons that I could find uh, on family, on fathering and husbanding, downloaded those onto my little iTouch. We had flip phones over there. We didn't have any uh, iPhones. So onto my iTouch, downloaded all the John Piper sermons I could find, and just listening to those walking through the streets, being built up. In God's word. So I have such vivid memories of that, as you can tell. But now, after this time back, I have the added experience of walking around the city with Trey Russell and Daniel Bailey ringing in my ears. The same places, the same streets, the same word of God building me up. Preached to my heart, strengthening my faith. So I just want to thank you, brothers, Trey and Daniel, for your work explaining and applying God's word to my heart. And I know that all of you feel the same way. Last week, In his final sermon on Amos, Trey asked the question, how will God restore Israel? And the answer he gave was simple but profound, and it is the only answer through the Messiah. How is it that this this, this nation of Israel so lost in sin, as you see repeatedly through the book of Amos, so under God's judgment, so under God's hand, how is it that this Israel will be restored? And the only answer is through the Messiah, through the descendant of David, through the booth of David. And that brings us to our next series this morning, on the Gospel of Luke. And this is where we get the coming of Israel's Messiah, the coming of the hope of the Gentiles, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so we get that in the Gospels, all this anticipation, all of this expectation coming to fruition in the Gospels that we find in the, in the New Testament. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Verses 1 to 4. This one is a little less hard to find than Amos in your Bible, so I imagine you uh, did not have to turn to the table of contents, though if you needed to, no problem, no shame uh, in that. Luke is one of four gospels that we have in the New Testament. I want to read a quote to you from uh, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo. They are, uh, they're 
introduction to the New Testament is one of the best, one of the most used in seminaries and Bible colleges. Uh, So by the way, if you're interested in that, this is a good one. Uh, Not the be all and end all, certainly not the only one, but this is a good introduction to the New Testament. And they deal with all the scholarly issues, uh, the, the questions of interpreting the New Testament. They deal with skeptics and arguments of scholars who, uh, who have attacked the New Testament, the reliability, the credibility, and so forth. So if you're interested in that sort of comprehensive approach to the New Testament, this is one I would recommend. But in that New Testament intro, Carson and Moo write this. The story of Jesus has come to us not in one super gospel, but in four gospels, each with, his, with its own distinct and important contribution to make to our understanding of Jesus. This fourfold gospel should be appreciated for the richness of perspective it brings. And any Christian who's read the four gospels knows the reality of that richness and how each gospel contributes to the building up of our faith in the Lord Jesus. They go on to quote Leon Morris in saying this, Jesus is such a gigantic figure that we need all four portraits to discern him. And uh, a a funny comment here, the, the gospel of Luke is the gospel historically in my life that I have spent the least time in. Probably the most time in Matthew and John, but the least time in Luke. So I'm very grateful to be able to have this opportunity to dig into, and then at the end of this, to be able to say, the gospel I've spent the most time in is the gospel of Luke. Since I've been at Four Corners, we've spent substantial time in John and Matthew. So when I came here, my first sermon was John 15, 1. Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches, and that took us all the way up to the end of chapter 21. And then a couple of years after that, we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, not all of Matthew, but that chunk of Matthew uh, where Jesus delivers his Sermon on the Mount. And my understanding is that early in the life of Four Corners, very early uh, in the Alamo days, that there was a series on the Gospel of Mark. Well, now... We get to dig in and spend our time in the gospel of Luke. We've spent time in the other three as a church, and now we will spend time in Luke. Over the last couple of years, with Exodus and Amos, we've had much anticipation of Christ. We've been able to see much of Christ in the Old Testament as he is presented to us uh, in, in, in these types that we've seen, in these prophecies that we've seen. Well, now... The anticipation comes to fulfillment. Now we get to walk with him week after week through a gospel as a church. A gospel written by Luke. Luke, the companion of Paul. Paul describes him as the beloved physician in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. So Luke, the doctor, whatever it is that that meant, Uh, in terms of the medicine at that time and uh, whatever that means about his background. We don't have those kind of details. But Paul refers to him in Colossians 4.14 as the beloved physician. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul makes note of his undying loyalty. Paul has been abandoned even by some of his closest, uh, abandoned not necessarily as those who reject the faith, although some of Paul's been, others have just left Paul's presence. They've found other things to go and do, other places to go and minister. But Paul refers to Luke as being the one who is with him alone. Luke alone is with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4 Verse 11. So at some point in the early 60s, as Paul is imprisoned in Rome, before Nero's persecution of the Christians, which Luke otherwise would have mentioned, before the fall of Jerusalem, which otherwise would have been mentioned, Luke writes his two-volume work, Luke-Acts. And so we are meant to understand Luke and Acts as two separate books, but we see them as sort of two volumes of one work. So we need to look at them individually, but at the same time, understanding that Luke and Acts really hang together. We can see them as two volumes of one work on the shelf. 
And in Acts, interestingly, we get these we passages where the author of Acts says, we did this and we did that. And we see this in Luke chapter, uh, Acts chapter 16, 20, 21, 27, and 28. And there, Luke is describing his experiences with the apostle Paul. So when we open up the gospel of Luke, we realize that this is someone who spent a ton of time with Paul who is preaching the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles. And many have pointed out that Luke really has a a Gentile orientation. It's oriented towards the Gentiles. Whereas we read a gospel like Matthew and we see a Hebrew orientation, uh, that it is directed towards a Jewish readership, largely. Uh, And and what we find with Luke is that it is uh, more of a gospel to the Gentiles. So this morning, we will begin with just the first four verses, not an indication of our pace throughout the entire series, uh, but at least for now, that's how much text we take on, and that's the first four verses. This is the prologue, or the preface, or the introduction to the gospel, however you want to word it, Uh, and it's nice that we get something like this, because it is the only gospel that gives us something like a preface, where the author actually addresses what went into the writing of the gospel and why the gospel was written. So the title for the sermon this morning is A Reliable Report. So if you would stand with me as we read God's word together. Luke chapter one, verses one to four. This is the word of God. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. You can go ahead and be seated. Let's pray. Let's ask for God's grace. God's grace in the preaching, God's grace in the hearing, because unless the Holy Spirit is working, uh, this will be in vain. Uh, We recognize that it is only God who can do things in our hearts, only God who can change us. Uh, It's only God who can uh, save us and sanctify us or save us progressively and then ultimately save us on that last day when he glorifies us in his presence. And so we need his spirit to help us in all of this. So let's ask for that. Father, we thank you for your grace and your kindness to us. We thank you that you've gathered us here together in your providence. God, you are so good to us and we thank you that you've put us this day Under the hearing of your word, you've put our eyes on the pages of scripture. Lord, this is a a moment we could say of crisis. This is a moment of great import as we are gathered in the name of Jesus to look at scripture. And God, we just praise you that you have done this in each of our lives. And you've done this for our kids. And God, we pray that this morning you would be exalted, that Christ would be lifted up as the king and the great savior. And Lord, we pray that each of our hearts would be cut by your word and that you would use that to heal us spiritually, Lord, that you would use that to conform us into the image of your son. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who is unsaved, who does not know you, that you would change them this morning. You would, you would convert them. Uh, God, you who said, let, let there be light, you can save Sinners, you've saved us. Uh, You've saved so many. Lord, you are mighty to save, and we pray that you would do that among us today. Lord, we ask that your spirit would guide this preaching and this hearing, and that you would carry it along, Lord, uh, with power in each of our hearts for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three things that we're going to look at this morning. And you'll find those up on the screen as we get this 
This prologue to the rest of the gospel, it it unfolds really neatly as it introduces the gospel as a whole. So three things, we get first the background, verses one to two. Then we get the writing, verse three, where Luke talks about his writing of the gospel. And then, in, and then thirdly, the goal, verse four. And it's so nice to get a goal. It's so nice to get a purpose. Uh, we, it anchors us as we go through the gospel. Uh, every step we take throughout this gospel, we don't get lost in uh, forgetting what it is that this is for. What is this for us as a church? What is this for each of us who's, who's sitting under this and reading this? There is a purpose And a goal, we find that in verse 4. So we begin with the background, verses 1 to 2. Look with me there, if you would, verses 1 to 2. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Here, Luke tells us what has gone on prior to the writing of his gospel. And the big thing we need to see is that it has been a time of intense activity. There has been speaking, writing, compiling of narrative accounts of Jesus. And he goes so far as to say that there are many, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished or fulfilled among us. These are accounts of what God has accomplished or brought to fulfillment in the coming of Christ. And and we don't have the information about how all of that unfolded. We've got the four gospels as the dust settles. God has given us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these four inspired accounts of Christ's ministry, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And then Acts gives us the early preaching of the church. But what Luke tells us here is that there were many of these compilations, many of these compositions, many of these accounts. And underneath all of this activity, this vibrancy, are the testimonies of eyewitnesses. Underneath all of this is eyewitness testimony. Those who saw Jesus during his earthly ministry and those who saw him as the raised Christ, those who saw him after he had risen from the dead. Eyewitnesses, of course, like the 12, that's the first group of people we think of, are these 12 disciples whom Jesus calls to himself. And then within the 12, we get this this very small circle, James, John, Peter, Within the 12, and the 12 are mentioned in Luke chapter 6. Then we get the 70, or the 72 that are mentioned in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. So we've got the 12, and then we've got the 70, but then we also have the 120, the 120 people who are gathered in the upper room after the ascension of Jesus, who are waiting on Pentecost, waiting on the coming of the Spirit. And we read about the 120 in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. So we've got these layers to the eyewitnesses and varying levels of eyewitness testimony, depending on who we're talking about. Among the 12, among the 70, among the 120, But these are just some categories to wrap our minds around as we think about who actually saw these things. And Paul will mention over 500 people who saw Jesus raised. He mentions that in 1 Corinthians 15. So now the 120 goes all the way up to 500. The eyewitnesses, as we read it here, from the beginning refers to those whose testimony goes all the way back to the baptism of John. So when Luke refers to these eyewitnesses from the beginning, we know that he has in mind the baptism of John, and the reason we know that is because of what is said in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, you might remember 
that this is the criterion that the apostles use for replacing Judas. Judas betrayed Christ, he killed himself, and now to round out the 12 with, with the testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, there needs to be one who has been there from the beginning, that is, all the way back to the baptism of John. This is from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Luke tells us here that everything is built on or based on eyewitness testimony. Now, this may be a category that you haven't given a lot of attention to. The importance of eyewitness testimony as we read throughout the New Testament. This is an emphasis throughout. We see it with Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, as I just referred to, verses 1 through 11. And in those verses, Paul lists those to whom the risen Christ has appeared. He is trying to reassure the Corinthians. He's trying to bolster their faith in the gospel of this raised Christ. And he does that by explaining to them that there are eyewitnesses, including Paul, who as one untimely born saw the raised Jesus after his ascension. And so we see an emphasis there on eyewitness testimony by Paul. This is also emphasized by both John and Peter. We could say these are sort of the most inner circle, closest to Jesus, John and Peter. And I want to read both of these passages because I want you to hear how these relate to what Luke is saying about the importance of eyewitness testimony. So here we go. The first one is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. And this is what the apostle says. Listen closely to his emphasis. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. That's the incarnation of Christ. That is his dwelling among men. The life was made manifest and we have seen it. We saw him and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. We beheld him. We saw his glory, we saw his deeds, we heard his words, we even touched him, we handled his body. This is the word of life. And we get this same thing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, and there Peter is referring to the transfiguration, this this moment where Jesus appears in absolute glory and splendor and Elijah and Moses are there talking with him. What an incredible experience for, for the apostles. And this is what Peter writes. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Maybe that's what you think Christianity is this morning. Maybe just cleverly devised myths. Peter says, we did not follow that. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard we heard it. It entered into our ears. We heard God the Father speak to his Son over his Son. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. We were there, says John. We were there, says Peter. We were there, says Paul. So Luke wants his readers to understand the background that many have written and that eyewitness testimony is the foundation. It is the bedrock. It is the rock-solid foundation upon which all of this 
is all of this energy, all of this vibrancy is happening in the early days of Christianity. So I want to just draw out a few implications for us as we take a step back and think about this background in verses 1 to 2. So first, and I think this is really important for us to process, the content is God's work. What is the gospel? The gospel, the content of the gospel is what God has done. It is God's work in and through Christ. Where do we see that here? Well, Luke says in the very first verse, he refers to what has been accomplished or fulfilled among us. And that raises the question, by whom? By whom has it been accomplished? By whom has it been fulfilled? And the answer is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God that we saw in Exodus, the same God that we saw in Amos, the same God that Daniel preached on in 3 John, this God is one. It is this God who has accomplished all of these things. It is this God who has fulfilled all of these things in and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is what the Father has brought to fulfillment through his son. So the content of the gospel is God's work. Now, as we appropriate the gospel, we recognize that we must have the gospel bear in on us personally, that it's a personal message. It's a practical message. It matters how we respond. And our response to it is a part of the proclamation of it. And yet, we never forget that the, the content and substance of the gospel is God did. God did. He's the active agent. He is the one who saves. A second implication for us uh, is just to, to camp out for a moment on this notion of eyewitness testimony. If you're here this morning, you're not a believer, this is, and, and you've just, maybe you've sat through some classes uh, in sort of very liberal, higher critical, uh, godless, um, naturalistic presupposition having types of settings in, in a college classroom or, or somewhere else, and, and you just, you've wondered about the historicity or just outright rejected the historicity of the Christian claims, consider what we have here. And my hope is that this would put you on a course of investigation. It is amazing to me how many people uh, you can talk to who, who just parrot things they've heard on TV somewhere or they've, some podcast or some YouTube video. Uh, they, they parrot something they've heard. Well, the Bible's full of contradictions or the Bible's full of errors. And then you ask them, well, can you give me a few? Can, can you tell me what you're referring to? Well, I mean, I don't know. It's just there. And that's typically what you hear. If they take the time to dig and take the time to look, what they will find is a historically reliable record. Many, a compilation of historically reliable records, eyewitness testimonies. A third implication for us to consider is that the eyewitnesses became, as we read here, ministers of the word. Literally, that's what it says. They became ministers of the word. They gave their lives to share what they saw. And, and that's another fascinating thing about the apostles is they saw these things and then they went and proclaimed these things unto death. Without fail, across the board, they were willing to die in awful, <coughs> horrific, excruciating ways for the testimony that they had seen Christ. You know, they start bringing in the sword and start bringing in the nails and start bringing in the flames, start bringing in later the wild beasts and so forth. You would think at that point, no, 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 we made it up. We made it up, it's not true, just let me go. 
Uh, we took his body from the tomb. Somehow uh, we were able to get that. Even those Roman soldiers there, stone there. We took his body, we went and hid it, and then we went around telling people about this fairy tale. No one dies for that. That's absolute folly. And maybe one or two fanatics might convince himself that that is true, but the whole body of these men went to their death for these truths. Yes, I saw him. I heard him. I felt him. Christ is true. Is true. The gospel is true. And as we think about them becoming ministers of the word after seeing, it just reminds us that seeing compels sharing. To experience Christ is to be compelled to make him known. To experience Christ, to witness Christ, is to want to magnify him in the world. And that's what we're doing in evangelism when we tell people about Christ is we're magnifying the one whom we have come to experience by faith, by the work of the Spirit in our hearts. We are proclaiming that which we have known to be true as God has saved us. So that's the background. Secondly, we come to the writing in verse 3. So look with me there, verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. This is the language of a historian. The language that Luke uses here is that of a historian. And in fact, Many have pointed out the links between Luke's prologue and other historical works in the ancient world. Uh, And uh, various sources are referred to, some of which are Josephus and Herodotus and Plutarch. Uh, These are writers in the ancient world who are writing historical types of works. And so (laughs) what we find here with Luke is he is using the language Of that world, he's using the language of a historian. He's setting out for his readers, this is what I am doing. And as many have pointed out, this is the best Greek in the New Testament. Uh, Luke is writing in a very literary way. This is going to gain lots of circulation, Luke anticipates. And he wants to connect it. He wants to root it to that literary tradition of history writing in the ancient world. No one reading this would have thought that Luke was doing anything other than conveying to the reader what he understood to be the events that had transpired. A true account, a true narrative. Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is setting out to do what has already been done. By many, he says, to varying degrees, but in his own way and at this particular time in the Jesus movement of the first century. Luke, as I said before, is a companion of Paul, and he has had the opportunity to look at the material that has already been produced about Jesus, this many Most would include Mark among these sources, and some would add Matthew. And by the way, if you're interested in the relationship of the Synoptic Gospels, uh, don't let that trip you up. In the Synoptic Gospels, you have uh, all of these parallels between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and yet they're, they're different. They order things differently, and so they're similar and different at the same time. This is has historically been called the synoptic problem. Problem not uh, drawing attention to it as some sort of uh, contradiction, but it's, a, it's a, a scholarly problem. It's a scholarly issue that scholars work through. Some of the answers to the question of the relationship of the synoptic gospels are much better than others. But if you're interested in looking at how evangelical Bible-believing scholars relate These gospels together, there are many things that I could recommend 
you to read. So uh, don't let something like that stump you. Don't let something like that trip you up. And by the way, let me just say this uh, on just an apologetic level. There's no issue you could ever discover, no, no, no sort of stumbling block you could ever come up to where there are not many very capable people who have written about these things. So don't let any of these things stump you as you're reading through the Gospels and and people are claiming their contradictions there. There are so many things that you can read that help to explain how these are not contradictions at all. And I'm not talking about fanciful attempts. I'm talking about real, balanced, level-headed, informed investigation into these issues, but from a believing heart, from someone who loves the God who has saved them. And so, for young people here, older people, whoever, don't let these scholarly questions cause you concern. But most would include Mark among these sources, some would add Matthew. But the truth is that we really don't know what sources Luke used. And we don't know if he used partial sources and, and, and full sources. We, we, we don't know sayings or, or maybe accounts of fulfilled prophecies or whatever it is that's there. We really don't know. We're simply not privy to the many of verse 1, to all of the literary and oral output of the earliest years of Christianity. We don't know the extent to which Luke interviewed people who were there. This unique material in the Gospel of Luke. We find uh, this annunciation to Mary, for example. We get these key insights into Herod. Uh, there, there's, there's individuals within the Gospel of Luke that Luke may have interviewed specifically himself. What we do know is that Luke very clearly and very emphatically explains to his reader that what he is writing can be trusted. And that's the big idea. That's the reason for the title, a reliable report. What you're reading, Luke says, this can be trusted. Not just trusted in some general way, but you can bank your whole life on it. You can bank your family's life on it. You can bank life on it right up until death. If you need die for it, you can bank everything on this word. He uses several words here to convey the reliability of his account. And and we would be tempted to just read through verse three really quickly, but if you look at the details, it, it, it really does attest to the intense reliability. It reminded me as I was reading it of what uh, Matthew says when the wise men come to little Jesus. When they come to toddler Jesus, and it says that they, they rejoiced with a joy very exceedingly. They rejoiced with a great joy exceedingly. I think that's the language. They, they rejoiced with a great joy exceedingly. Not just they rejoiced, they rejoiced with a joy. And it wasn't just joy, it was great joy. And it wasn't just great joy, it was exceedingly great joy. It's that sort of thing. That's what we have here. Really, really happy the wise men were when they saw Jesus. And really, really true and really, really emphatic is Luke here about the credibility of what he's writing. So first, I want want you to see these five, uh, these five aspects of his language. So first, Luke says that he has followed or he has paid careful attention to. This could also be translated investigated, that Luke has investigated, and we find that in the NIV and the NASB, uh, they use the verb investigated. He has dug into the material, and he has done it with the intensity of a researcher trying to put the pieces together. One of the things that Jennifer and I like to to watch are the sort of crime documentaries and and particularly cold case documentaries. We've watched a number of those over the years, and it's always fun to watch these these investigators, these detectives. They, They immerse themselves in the data. They immerse themselves in the evidence and they try to come to conclusions that that have been overlooked. They try to solve problems that have not been solved. Or you think of a researcher, 
an archaeologist who finds something tiny, the size of a coin, and they're trying to fill out around that object what it means, where it's from, and all the rest. We get the picture here of an intense researcher, an investigator, trying to put the pieces together. Second, he has done this following or this investigating with great care. Luke uses an adverb that means diligently or accurately. And so he has investigated accurately or diligently. Third, he has done this from the beginning. From the beginning, which is a better way to translate what the ESV puts as for some time past. You'll read that in the ESV, for some time past. A better way to translate that is from the beginning. In other words, he has investigated carefully or accurately back to the very beginnings of this movement. As we will see, he will go all the way back to the conceptions of John the Baptist and Jesus. So he doesn't just go to the birth of Jesus. Well, let me say it this way. He doesn't just go back to the preaching of John the Baptist. He doesn't just go back to the childhood of Jesus. He doesn't just go back to the birth of Jesus. He doesn't just go back to the conception of Jesus. He goes back to the conception of John the Baptist. He goes all the way back to the beginning. Fourth, he has investigated, it says here, all things. He has investigated everything. He has left nothing out of his inquiry. No rock unturned. He has taken great care and great time to wade through the evidence. And it strikes me, uh, I, I wonder, all of the dialogue between Luke and Paul and the way in which Paul is instrumental in all of this, we don't know. We just don't have answers to those questions. But he has looked into everything. Fifth, and finally, he is writing an orderly account. One that will take us from the conception and birth of Jesus and even John, Jesus' forerunner, all the way to the ascension. And if we are to include Acts, which we should, he takes us all the way to the unhindered gospel preaching of Paul in Rome in Acts chapter 28, verse 31. That's that's amazing. The scope of that is amazing. And I I would just encourage you, take, take a year and just read Luke and Acts. Just because just, we're going to be doing that for a while. I mean, I don't know about Acts. We'll have to get there and talk about that. But um, take a year in your own personal Bible reading, your own time, and just read through Luke and Acts and see the way it goes all the way from the, the conception of John the Baptist to the unhindered preaching of Jesus the Christ in the capital of the empire. Unhindered. Credible work of God. As we think about this emphasis on it being an orderly account. I want to read you a couple of quotes from some scholars who have reflected on what what does Luke mean when he says an orderly account? So here's one, Daryl Bach, and many have celebrated his commentary as the best on Luke, Uh, but this is what he writes. Luke is broadly chronological in its flow, but there is some rearrangement of material. And we see that Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the different order they use. There is a geographical arrangement to the material as well. Geography is very important for Luke, especially this movement towards Jerusalem. Luke's order is also salvation historical in that it shows the progress of salvation under God's direction. Thus, he concludes, the order of Luke's account works on many levels. It is broadly chronological and geographical and deals with sacred History. Let me read you one more quote from William Hendrickson. And he says this about this orderly account. By and large, the sequence of events as reported in Luke is chronological. On the other hand, with respect to individual details, this is by no means always the case. It will become clear that Luke makes no mistakes. He has his good reasons for writing exactly as he does, as guided by the Spirit. To him, A logical or topical connection is frequently more important than precise chronological sequence. Throughout, he is writing a truly orderly account as he promises here in chapter 1, verse 3. 
So orderly does not necessarily mean that this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened, but there is a topical dynamic, there's a geographical dynamic, and there's also, uh, of course, all along the way, Luke's theological purposes as he organizes this material in order to convey the glory of Christ in space and time. So if we are to put the pieces together of Luke's language, we could translate the text literally as this, it seemed good or fitting to me, also having carefully investigated all things from the beginning accurately to write to you in order. That's what Luke is saying. So that brings us to whom is he writing? To whom is Luke writing? writing. And specifically, he says here, to most excellent Theophilus. Most excellent Theophilus. The name itself means lover of God or a friend of God, but it is probably not merely symbolic. Some have said, well, this is any lover of God, any friend of God. It's probably not the case, though in God's providence, this person does happen to be named that. This is likely a real person, Probably Luke's patron who has paid for the writing and distribution of his gospel. And the descriptor most excellent implies that he is someone of high status, likely a Gentile. And the reason that we know this is probably someone of status is Luke uses this same descriptor elsewhere in Acts for the governors of, of, the, Rome, of, of the Judea, of that area, from the Roman governors. So in Acts 26.5, he refers to most excellent Festus. And so that tells us that what we have here is probably someone of status who is helping Luke to compose this gospel. So now I want to take a step back again and just look at some implications of what we've seen here. The first one is, I just want you to see the great care involved in presenting the message of Jesus. And once again, it just reminds us that what we believe is historically rooted. These, is, these are not just philosophical propositions that live in the ether. These are real things that happened. They are historically reliable. They are credible. They are trustworthy. A second point that I want you to see is that Scriptural inspiration moves within history and personality. God doesn't just give us these wooden documents that are inspired by the Spirit. The Spirit inspires the writing of these documents through the instrumentality of the writers. And so Luke has his style, and Paul has his style, and John has his and they have their own personalities. They have their own predispositions in terms of how their mind orders these things. And yet in all of this history and in all of this personality, God has given us his very word, the inspiration of the scriptures. He has given us this infallible word through fallible instruments since the beginning, since Moses. And finally, The reference to Theophilus reminds us that the gospel message confronts the individual. The gospel of Luke is written for all. It's written for everybody. It has a universal, general readership. And yet here we get in the very beginning this laser beam focus on Theophilus. And the same is true for each of us. As we read Luke, as we go through Luke, the Lord is speaking to each of our hearts through this gospel writer. You could put your name in that spot. You may want to leave off the most excellent part uh, for modesty's sake, uh, but put your name there because it is directed to your heart, Christian. It is directed to my heart. It is directed to all of us and each of us. Finally, we come to the goal. So we've seen the background, the writing, and now we get briefly stated in verse four, the goal or the purpose. So look with me there. That you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So why? Why does Luke write this gospel? What is his objective? What is his purpose? 
Well, here it is stated succinctly and clearly that Theophilus and anyone else who picks up this gospel to read it may have certainty concerning the things that he has been taught. This suggests for us that Theophilus is probably a believer who has already undergone some teaching in the Christian faith, though we don't know uh, exactly. He might be uh, someone who is interested in the faith and hasn't quite believed, but it seems as though he's someone who has already been instructed in this Jesus movement, a new convert, someone who has heard the gospel. Maybe he's part of Caesar's household that Paul refers to in Philippians as he is imprisoned there in Rome. We don't know. Uh, Someone of status who is probably a new convert and has undergone some teaching. And here, Luke wants to bolster his faith to hold him fast to what he has learned, to foster greater assurance and confidence in the content of the message about Jesus. I'm gonna lay this out for you, Theophilus. I want you to see, I want you to viscerally feel the glory of God in Christ. I want you to know, I want you to be certain, I want you to be rooted, I want you to be assured Persecution is a reality. It has come from the Jews and will come from the Romans. And and just a short time after this, Nero will persecute the Christians. He will feed them to animals. He will dip them in tar and light them on fire in his garden. The Christians will suffer grievously for their faith in Christ. And perhaps Theophilus himself will undergo such a death we do not know but Luke wants him to be sure and he wants him to know that these things are true he wants all of his readers to have certainty about the truthfulness of what they have been taught This is very similar to what we read in John's gospel as the apostle John himself, an eyewitness of Jesus, says this towards the end. John gets to the end of his gospel. See, Luke, at the beginning of his gospel, tells us why he's writing it. John tells us at the end of his gospel why he has written it. And this is what he says. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. Elsewhere, he says, the book's If if there were books all of the world, they could not contain all that Jesus had done. But he says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Belief, certainty, life. And that's my prayer for all of us as we set out on this journey that the glory of Christ would become so powerful to each of us that we are willing to renounce everything for this master and to follow him to the end. Whatever that end may mean, to be laughed at by this darkened culture for this Christ and to suffer, whatever that might mean. To follow him to the end with our faith bolstered and our lives in his hand. That is my prayer for us as we set out on the gospel of Luke. Let's pray. Father, We praise you that you are the sovereign Lord of all history. And God, the works that you accomplished through your son will be celebrated forever. We praise you that we have these precious documents and that they have been preserved for us through history. Lord, we thank you for Luke, our brother who wrote this gospel under the inspiration of your spirit. Just as we thank you for Moses, a real man 
and Amos, a real man, and John, a real man, in space and time, flesh and blood, human, born in Adam, just like all of us, and yet men who saw in their own way and in their own time the glory of this Christ. And Lord, we are the same. I pray that we would see him, that we would believe and have rock-solid confidence, and that we would proclaim him and serve him all of our days. In Christ's name, amen.